Well, welcome. Uh, you're online, obviously, watching this this morning. I'm glad you could join us here at Family Church. Uh, I'm Craig Hall, and I'm glad you could be a part of our message uh, this morning. Right now in our campuses, we actually have uh, some missionaries that are visiting, and we're interviewing them. And I'm giving you basically the summary of this interview. And so uh, I think it's an important discussion, as last week we really went into uh, a look at Scripture of what it means to follow Jesus and be sent by Jesus. And so uh, Pastor Drew did this great walkthrough of the story in Matthew of the demon-possessed man. And one of the key things that came up in our passage last week was this idea of barriers, that this demon-possessed man, he had many barriers that people stayed away from him. And he's not the kind of guy that would just walk into the temple uh, and go worship with the Jews. So for one, he wasn't a Jew, he was a Gentile. And there's no way he's gonna enter into the, the temple area where only the Jews could go. So we talked about barriers. And just think about the other barriers real quick that were brought up last weekend. We had the barriers that, well, he's scary. I mean, the guy's breaking chains. He's out living amongst the tombs. So he's probably considered unclean to these people. Uh, not to mention the fact that the fact that he's demon-possessed uh, is not the kind of guy that most people are like, hey, let's go hang out and visit with this person. And so we talked about barriers because you and I, we face other barriers of presenting the gospel to people in our community, no matter what culture you live in. There are a variety of barriers. So I actually wanted to start this morning with a quick personal evaluation. So if you want to write this down, grab your notebook. Um, here's, here's my two questions. So what barriers do you have to cross in your community? So wherever you're watching from, uh, where you work, where you play, where you go to school. What are the barriers? And I broke it into kind of two different ones. I think there are personal barriers. I think we have personal barriers that, that keep us from proclaiming the gospel, of going and sharing the good news of Jesus. I think the personal ones, a couple that I wrote down, and maybe you could evaluate yourself, but I think some of the barriers are our own fears that keep us from proclaiming the gospel to others. Just, just our fear what will they say? What will happen? And of course, I was just uh, in a place in Africa where when you broadcast the gospel, it is illegal to teach the gospel to a Muslim. And so there, in that region where we we're at, there's a lot of fears for those who are recently following Jesus or have been for years about even proclaiming the gospel. And they're, they're understandable fears. Um, what about uh, maybe your own biases that you have some political biases, you have this or that. There's lots of things that get in the way that are personal barriers that are internal. And then cultural would be the external. What's, what's going on in the culture around you? Um, you know, some of maybe political barriers that you know people that see things differently from a political lens and you see that as a barrier for you because you disagree on some key topics. Or maybe there's ones about their religion or maybe their sexual orientation. There's, these are all the barriers that are in the culture around us that can be walls from us going and proclaiming the gospel or for them coming in to hear the good news of Jesus. So I think this is an important understanding as we're going to look today uh, from a, a bit of a global perspective. Uh, we're going to look at different barriers. But I, so I want to take you into Colossians 4. So if you want to open your Bibles to Colossians chapter 4, we're going to look at verses 2 through 6. I love this, this small section as the Apostle Paul is writing, and he's basically giving the charge of what it means to live a life on mission, to live a life with the intentionality of proclaiming, as he'll refer in this passage, the mystery of Christ. So follow with me as we look at Colossians chapter 4, uh, verses 2 through 6, says this, it says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity and let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. I want to just take a moment, if you have your pens and you have a Bible you can write in, or maybe you can highlight in whatever app you're using, just do a quick 
quick noting here. Let's, let's just focus on a couple key points real quick. One, there was a devotion to prayer. Are you devoted to prayer? This is evaluation time. Two, uh, there's a devotion to being watchful, looking and listening around you. Who's, who's interested? Who's curious about the gospel? And then, of course, being devoted to being thankful. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have much to be thankful for. You have been given the gift of eternal life. We should be thankful, even in the most difficult of situations, that Christ has redeemed us. So it says, be devoted to this. I I encourage you to maybe circle those. Those are important. A couple others that I thought would be worth looking at is, um, what about the open doors? Now, Paul says, pray for me that there would be open doors, but I would encourage you to pray for yourself that you would be aware of the open doors in your community around you. And then, of course, I felt like um, this idea, the concept of being open to outsiders, being gracious, understanding those barriers that are out there, knowing that those who do not believe the way you believe as a follower of Jesus automatically have a different view of things. Be open to outsiders. And of course, grace sprinkled with grace and seasoned with salt so that when they leave, they don't go, wow, that person is very lemony (laughs) and bitter. They're salty. There's something about them that it's enjoyable to be around them. And even when they speak things that I don't quite agree with, I find it pleasurable to be around the conversation. It's a good encounter. So I want to take this concept, this idea, and apply it to the globe, though. Because I think sometimes we think proclaiming the gospel in Oregon is vastly different than somewhere else in the world. And so for those that have been around Family Church long enough, back in 2006, we actually got involved in focusing on unreached people groups. So Cambodia was where we were called. It's where Family Church began to impress energy, finances, and relationship in 2006. And the key missionaries that that we started to work with were Craig and Jenny Mallow. Now, Craig and Jenny had been there since the early 90s, and so they're 35 or so years now of investment in that region. I just pause for a second. 35 years. For those of you who are new in the journey of Christ, do you have a long-range vision of disciple-making that you see that your purpose extends beyond today? next month, next year. There's a commitment level required. 35 years is what it takes. And, they, and he'll tell you, they went from very little evidence of God working in people's lives, and over the course of decades, they saw transformation happening. I think it's important that we get a longer range view of our call as followers of Jesus to make disciples in our communities. But Craig and Jenny, they spent time in Cambodia. And so I began to ask some questions. And so I wanted to start to bring it into the context of what is it like for a Cambodian, a Krung people group in the area that they, that they serve in. So I asked the question, what are the barriers that a Krung person has to the gospel? What are those barriers? So he goes in, of course, and uh, the first thing he said is, is kind of three I want to pull out. He says, one, there was huge cultural differences. Uh, a white American from Chicago showing up in the villages of Cambodia, the, the cultural differences were huge. And so he said it this way, they basically, this particular people group, have very little understanding of the outside world. So understand when he arrived in the 90s, there's no cell phones, there's no internet, there's no, uh, you know, Instagram or tweets or anything going on. He goes into a place where many of these people have never left their village. So the cultural divide is huge. They're an animistic culture. They believe that spirits rule the world and that they have to sacrifice animals to appease those spirits, to get rid of illness and to get rid of uh, crop failures or whatever. So the cultural views were very different. They also didn't have any understanding. Their worldview is that the worldview differences were they did not have any view of science. Like the concept of science to them was very foreign. So everything that happened was all spirit-based. And he said it this way. He says, the animism doesn't teach any set of moral principles like Christianity or even some of the other religions. But he said, at least there was one commonality. They believed in the supernatural. But their worldview is very different. 
But that is a commonality. They believed in spirit, the spirit world. And we refer to the spirit of God. We refer to saints and all these uh, demonic things. We, we have a commonality there. But the third, of course, was the language difference. The lang- language differences. So that was a barrier that came in because there was nobody to teach the language. There were no courses or textbooks. And oftentimes, if you found somebody that could speak enough English, you would have to tell them what to teach you (laughs) because they don't know how to teach their language. They don't know how to explain that. And we even find out that prior to the Mallows arriving, we had other Bible translators there that they had to develop a written language for this people. There wasn't even a written form. Everything was all oral. There was no written language. So there was a lot going on in this, this area. And not only were we working with the Krung, but the Brow people in 2019, we, we adopted them as well. And there was a, a great similarity between those two people groups. And their differences were identical, though. Even though they were a different people group, even though they lived within the same geographic area, they still had spirit worship and animism. They still had the cultural uh, views that were different. They were still very isolated. And so he enters into going to proclaim the gospel and imagine the difficulty. Many of you right now, you don't go to work and work with a group of people that don't speak English. I'm guessing if you're watching this, that you live and work in a place where everybody speaks the same language. They may speak wear similar clothing. They eat similar foods. They even have some of the similar understandings of science and, and of religions around the world. So some of those barriers are, are not all that, uh, I guess you'd say, common for you. Those aren't necessarily ones that you have to cross. But this is a big difference when you go to the cross-cultural part. Um, but here's what he said. The very act of learning the language shows a sincerity from the learner to the people that you're learning their language of. So how do we begin to break through the barriers? That was just one of the ideas he shared. He says, the fact that you are willing to learn the language. And I remember uh, just a few weeks ago, there's this this language that uh, in this place I was in in Africa, and I don't know the language at all. I mean, it's very foreign to me. But I learned a couple of the basics. Like I learned how to say hello, and I learned how to say thank you. And, uh, and this one person said, well, you don't speak uh, the, the local language like some of the other Americans I see. Uh, these are you know, workers who come, missionary workers who come into the region. They, they intentionally learn the language. And these people were acknowledging, it's really cool. They show up and they start learning our language. Well, you don't know it. And I, so I, I touted off my hello and my thank you. And they were like, oh, you're already learning it. And I'm like, well, not really. I could do enough to get me in trouble. That's it. That was all I had. But it was kind of interesting to see that they responded well to the idea, learning my language. That barrier is a big one. But they responded well to say, that was cool that you're trying. They like that. So kind of moving on, we're looking at, so what, what is it like as you worked in this region? So you had to learn the language, but what else did you do, Craig, to, his name is Craig, my name is Craig, so that's going to get really confusing, um, Craig with a K. What did you do to help cross those barriers, though? So we already said he's learning the language. But there's a whole lot of other elements there. And I think oftentimes we think, oh, to proclaim the gospel means to come in and have an awesome presentation of a biblical truth. And to be honest, if you can't speak the language, that's not going to go over very well. So what do you do in the meantime? And here's, here's some of the things that he said. First of all, yes, learn the language. But secondly, he said we provided aid. In fact, he says initially in that time, there was a massive flood and it destroyed all of the rice crops. And so one of the things they did is they would provide rice. 40, what do you say, 40 tons. Yeah, 40 tons of rice were given into this region, donated by uh, generous givers and then distributed by the missionaries who work in that region. Uh, Also, he said mosquito nets, that was a big issue. They brought in tons and tons of mosquito nets to help with malaria. If you don't know much about malaria, get bit by a mosquito and you can get incredibly sick and many people die from the disease. So they come in, and they show favoritism. They, they love on people with food, mosquito nets. And then the one that really stood out to me was they started to provide wells. They were providing literacy classes. Um, and then they started to train the older women how to, del- how to deliver babies. See, the death rate of a child in this region was incredibly high when they first arrived. 
Uh, even the times that I've been there, uh, they talk about if a woman is sick, has a fever, that she will not breastfeed the baby because the superstition, the spiritual things are, you'll kill the baby if you feed them. And so babies would die of starvation just from that lack of understanding of the science and the reality that the fever you have is not transmitted to this child. Uh, so they, they began to build, and this is the key word for you and me, regardless of our cultural barriers, regardless of the region or where you live, they were building trust. And trust is a key piece in crossing huge barriers. If they don't trust you, why would anybody want to listen to what you have to share anyways? I think I totally agree with that. I think I want to build trust with people first. So Craig said they built trust, and, and this was some of the ones. And, I, and then another thing he said is, so in that region, is there anything that as you learn the language, the barrier comes down, as you begin to build relationship, as you build trust, what, what's a barrier that seems to exist today to an American who's a missionary and even a Cambodian who's a follower of Jesus? And he said, the number one barrier that exists is that Christianity is still seen as a foreign religion. And that's a hard barrier for even the local believers and the local lost to not see it that way. Now, as the believers there, they get it. But those who don't believe yet in Cambodia, you know, regardless of what they see happening in the lives of the new believers, it's still to them a foreign religion. And so they're struggling with that. And so, so we moved on and I asked them the next question is basically this idea here is, where do you see God working though? So as you've spent 30 plus years, you've learned language, you've learned to build trust. People in that region know who you are. They know what you're willing to do. They know the love you have for them. What do you see and how do you see this working out? And I thought this was interesting, so I'm gonna expand on them. But he said, one, the extended family, is being changed, that you demonstrate the character of Christ and there's a deliverance from sin. So let me, let me kind of develop that a little more for you. The first thing he noticed, and I, I want you to take note of this. Basically, here's the, the heart of the question. What does a new believer in Cambodia, how do they proclaim the gospel in their culture, just like you and me? And here's the, the evidences that Craig brings out first. It always starts, he said, in the extended family. It starts with a mother, a father, son, daughter, grandma, aunt, uncle, that the movement of God begins to happen in the family. And how important is that for you and I to love our families well and proclaim the mystery of Christ well to our children, to our grandchildren, our nieces, our nephews, that the extended family is where the first, <laughs> it has the least number of barriers, now, some of you go, that's not true. I've got major barriers between me and my brother. I get it. But from the idea of the family unit, the young child in the home, mom and dad, and they're proclaiming Christ to them in their growing up years, there's very few barriers. And it's a great opportunity. So he said, one, that's what extended family means. It started to move in the family. Generations began to be transformed. The second part where it said demonstrating character. I think this is, this is for you and me. He said this, when Christians demonstrated character, people started asking questions and that opened the opportunity for teaching. People started asking questions. They would say, you don't sacrifice chickens anymore. Why do you go to the hospital? So, and they would have to share. We don't believe that animal sacrifice is, is necessary. God heals, and we have doctors. We have medicines. They're very beneficial. And so it opened up the ideas. And so he expanded. He said, it's often sickness, death by accidents in the community, financial crisis, all those things that start to bring an openness as a believer in Christ responds differently. People in their family and community would begin to ask questions. Why aren't you this? Why aren't you responding that way? Why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you killing this animal? And it opened up the idea. So what he said is the character of Christ was on display even in their young years of faith. 
And those who are watching begin to ask questions. So just make it personal for just a moment. Does that apply to you? Do you think that as you go into the public, does your character draw an openness to conversation? I think it's worth evaluating that. And using the text this week in your devotions, I encourage you to do that. I'm walking you through Colossians every day this week. There's no race here. Let's dig in this week. Let's look at and, and really evaluate our lives through Colossians. The last part was deliverance from sin. And this is really, for this region, this was a big deal. He said it this way. He said, when somebody genuinely believes in this region, um, one, not only are they delivered from sin, that redemption comes to them and they begin to see that and realize that because of the Spirit of God working in them. But here's what he said. They, they often uh, no longer deal with drunkenness because they're being transformed that that's a part of their culture that begins to, they separate from. Um, they're no longer living in the fear of these spirits. They're putting their faith in Christ, not in what the spirits are doing. They're no longer treating their wives or their husbands poorly. There's a unity that starts to happen and a love for one another that's very different than how the culture behaved previously, their culture. And then, of course, the sexual promiscuity. Um, those who are unmarried, the the a sex outside of marriage, all of those aspects which were highly lifted up in their culture, they begin to live differently as a result of God's word and the transformation in their life. And so all these things are on display. Uh, their anger, of course, they're working on anger. They're starting to be less of an angry people. Greed becomes less of an issue. In fact, it was interesting just thinking of greed where I was just at in Africa. Um, being greedy about the other things in your neighborhood is like one of the worst offenses in the culture where I was just at. Like they put that above murder almost to covet and be greedy over somebody else's belongings. So it's amazing when we look at the cultures around. When that becomes less of who you are and Christ becomes more, how obvious it is for people. They're like, wow. Well, in Cambodia, greed is kind of a big deal. And they uh, oftentimes, there's a lot of greed and a lot of disputes over possessions. And, and then these followers of Christ start to not deal with that as much. And they start to realize, God is calling me not to be greedy. And so they're transformed in that process. So let's, let's press in a little further, though. Now you've got people coming to faith. You're still working with them as a missionary. You've, you've crossed a lot of cultural barriers. You're discipling them. You're helping raise them up in God's word. So what does it look like now really diving into a believer in Cambodia? Let's press a little further there. And these are the three things that really came up. And I know that I've kind of been working on them here. Um, but I, so I guess just to recap, I realize I put, forgot to put this slide up, but here's the basic idea. Let me just, just emphasize it real fast. One, foreign religion, it's, that's a barrier. They have to keep coming over. Being a follower of Jesus is a foreign religion still to those who aren't believers. They see it as foreign religion, demonstrating life change and then leaving those animistic superstitions. So, sorry, that was, uh, I kind of missed that little spot there, but I just want to bring us to kind of driving this home. I asked Craig, so what's the advice that you have? Like, what advice do you have for people here listening right now? They're not in Cambodia. They live in a culture that's very similar. What advice do you have? And so he, he kind of put it this way. Three key words. Location, know your barriers, and live sent. Location, know your barriers, and live sent. And I said, all right, so what do you mean by that? <laughs> what do you mean? The first thing he said is, just because you're called to go proclaim the gospel does not mean you're called across the world. It's very clear that that he was, and many are, and they're called to go into places like Cambodia and all around. He says, but you've got to know your location. You see, wherever God has you right now is where you're called to proclaim. He says, it's not about someday you'll be somewhere. It's that it starts where you are. This was a big point. For a Cambodian, as soon as they come to faith, they don't go, oh, you know what? I probably need to go to uh, Africa, or I probably need, no, they need to start where they are. They do need to invest in their community. They need to love people and they need to cross the same barriers that you and I struggle with, the differences, the differences of culture, the differences of belief and so forth. So your location, he says, 
Don't forget, your location matters. So he says, like here in the United States, for instance, he says, you don't have to learn the language, but you do need to be approachable. For most of you, you don't have to learn the language, but you do have to be approachable. So he says, develop close relationships wherever you are, whatever your location. Demonstrate the Christian character, whatever your location, and provide clear teaching when the opportunities arise. Be open to share as people have questions. I hope you live your life in a way that people have questions. And it should be the kind of questions like, why aren't you mad today because this happened in an election cycle? Or why aren't you mad today because that person hit your car? You responded so differently. Oh, man, what an open door opportunity. Well, yeah, I'm upset. But that's not where my hope is. That's not where I find everything is in my car or in my this or my that. I have a hope in Christ. It's an open door idea. So one, know your location. Two is know your barriers. Um, this is what he, he said. He said, understanding the barriers is understanding that everywhere you go, there are different socioeconomic statuses, the, the financial ladder. Where do you sit on that ladder? Do you make a, a great sum of money or a little? And wherever you sit, you often look at other people differently. Oh, they don't have enough if I'm over perhaps financially and I look down on people. That's a barrier I've placed on myself. So know what your barriers are. What's keeping you from from associating with others and being open to outsiders. He says their values are different, their political views, their hobbies, all of the things that they perhaps, lifestyles, the race they run, whether it's a financial race or whether it's just focused on sports, whatever it is. He says, know your barriers and know the barriers of others. Be sensitive to that. And then finally, he said to live sent. So John 20, 20, I put a reference there, 20, 21. There's this moment where Jesus is speaking and he says, peace be with you. And he says, as the Father sent me, as Jesus came to dwell with us, to show us what it means to live a life of character, and died and rose again. And then as he departed, he says this, as the Father sent me, so I'm sending you. What Craig said was, live sent. Live with intentionality that no matter what community you're going into, whether it's foreign or local, wherever you go, to live sent. I want to bring us back to Colossians because I think Colossians gives us a framework for what it means to live sent. What does that mean? Let's go back to the passage. Colossians 4, 2 through 6. How do I live sent? Let's be real practical. One, devote yourselves to prayer. Devote yourselves to prayer every day, all day. Devote yourselves to prayer. God, show me how how can I grow? Where do I need to grow? Devote yourself to being watchful that every encounter is an opportunity. It may not be their transformational moment, but it's the pathway in their journey and you've been sent to help them in that path. Devote yourselves to being thankful. Remember the goodness of God, his grace in your life, and the gift he gave you. If you're a follower of Christ, you are a citizen of heaven. Everything is at your disposal. His power, everything he has is yours. Be thankful. And then we go on. Pray that God would open doors. Pray that we would speak clearly. Pray that I could proclaim the mystery of Christ. And if you don't understand what it means, the mystery of Christ, I encourage you to go look further into that. I don't have the time to unravel it all, but let's just put it into one word, the gospel. It is a mystery, and it's an incredible gift that he gives us. Pray that I would proclaim it clearly. How do I live sent? I pray continually that I would proclaim it clearly, that when the questions come, I seek the Spirit's leading and the Spirit guides me in my response. Be wise. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Don't be so quick to judge. Don't be so afraid. Don't be so quick to think just because your message isn't what they line up with yet that they don't want to hear it. Be wise in your approach to outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. A kind gesture, a cup of rice, a mosquito net, those are all ways in which we open up opportunities. We make the most of them. And of course, finally, let your conversations always be full of grace. 
I think we forget sometimes that ears are always watching. This, uh, <laughs> I was really aware of this in my most recent trip into Africa. We were in a place where every encounter, whether you were in the taxi cab or the, or the restaurant, on the street, in the market, there were always people listening. And we never were afraid to proclaim that we're followers of Jesus. We're not ashamed of the gospel. But for the protection of those around us, we were always cautious that we didn't talk about missionaries or talk about church or talk about things in the public that draw attention to those who are serving faithfully there and the believers who are trying to figure out how to operate in a Muslim environment. So let your conversation be full of grace, but be aware of what you're saying. There's always people listening, and they're always watching. And usually, unfortunately, like my kids, um, the things that I've said in my anger, the things I've said in my disappointment moments of myself are the things they remember the most. Why is that? Why is it that the time I hit my thumb and, and shout out a, a curse word, that that's what they remember from six years old? But they don't remember the love, perhaps, the hug I gave them or the time I said, I'm sorry. So let your conversations be seasoned with salt and full of grace. I just want to leave you with what we've been working through. I want to continue this idea of a rhythm of life. To live sent means to live a blessed life, a blessed strategy of life. To begin in prayer, to look and listen, eating together, finding the opportunities to open up relationship, to serve one another, to serve those in need and let them serve you too when appropriate. And then of course, the S is to share your story. The time will come for you to share your story. And thank you guys for joining me this morning. I wish you were with us, uh, with our missionaries in our campuses, but I hope this gives you a little picture that the, the gap between sharing the gospel in Cambodia and America is much smaller than you think. Everybody's in need of Christ. The barriers are different, but the need is the same. Let's pray together. Thank you, God, so much for your word, for the way that you... Gosh, you've saved us and you've redeemed us, but you've given us purpose. Thank you that you send us, but that we aren't sent alone. We thank you for your spirit that's alive in us. And I pray that each person watching today can go through Colossians and just evaluate, where's my devotion? Where am I devoted today? Thank you for loving us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us. See you next time.